five miles, angle six. Roger, that's the only one I've got right there where the pointer is. Welcome back to the channel. You're listening to the DCS Sit Rep, and I'm your host, Prickly Hedgehog. Join me now once again as we dive into another newsletter from Eagle Dynamics last week. This one starting with an announcement from Decca Ironworks Simulations that they are in the process of releasing a brand new aircraft for the game, and it's going to be the J82, a PP variant. Now, according to the blurb, during the 1980s, China's J-7 and J-8 aircraft could no longer confront the threats of the Su-24 and the Tu-22 from the north. Therefore, there was an urgent need for a fighter with medium-range interception capabilities that consequently gave birth to the J-8-2. And in order to install a larger radar for the aircraft, the nose air intake and its shock cone were replaced with an Ogival radome and lateral air intakes. Indeed, if you look at the aircraft, although we only got uh, the one picture, but online if you start digging into the history of this particular aircraft, which goes back to the 1960s, uh, it does appear to be, for all intents and purposes, a backwards-engineered MiG-21 slash MiG-23 with a little bit of Phantom IV in there as well. If you look at the rear stabilizers, Nonetheless, this was a Chinese-derived aircraft, if you want, um, borrowed heavily from pre-existing or existing Russian aircraft. They also added WP-13B turbojet engines, and as an interceptor, it could carry medium-range air-to-air missiles and fly at Mach 2.2 at 12,000 meters, so no slouch in the speed territory at all. The upgraded aircraft by Grumman, known as the J-8PP, was fitted with an APG 66 V radar, a 1553 bus or B bus, and other Western devices. It was the first time that data bus concepts were introduced to the Chinese aviation industry. The launch and guide Aspied PL 11 medium range missiles, a Chinese made continuous wave emitter, was installed to work with that radar. The J-8PP can perform medium-range interception against low-altitude, high-speed, and high-altitude, high-speed intruders. It also has some limited ground attack capability. The module, when it is finally released, will include the flyable version of the J-8PP and also an AIJ-8F variant. Now, the PP version will include the following features. The... Radar, as mentioned, an APG 66V PRC F8 radar with NAM, STT, ACM, GM, and AGR modes, an AUG 27 for loadout management, a fire control computer from Westinghouse, an LN39 INS system, a HUD from GEC, a head down display from Honeywell, an air data computer, CPU 140A from GEC, radar warning receiver. SPJ IFF, the aforementioned WP-13B turbojet engines, air-to-air missiles, ASPID PL-11, PL-8, and PL-5, and unguided weapons will include 250kg G general purpose bombs or GP bombs and 57mm and 90mm rockets. So an interesting module, an interesting concept, not one I'm very familiar with, and I did a little bit of research ahead of time. Uh, This aircraft, like I said, does borrow heavily from the MiG-21, and it's going to be interesting to see how it slots in among the Cold War aircraft. And it's an interesting hybrid, if you like, of Russian, Chinese, and Western technologies. And I think that uh, is kind of an interesting mix. I'm not really all that familiar with that kind of cooperation between, uh, you know, so, so many different countries, essentially. Uh, to produce this aircraft. Now, it's not without some controversy, too. Several years ago, a J-8 variant did collide with an American reconnaissance plane, I believe, and unfortunately for the Chinese pilot, he did not survive that particular encounter. The American aircraft was able to return to base, 
So again, uh, some interesting history there that uh, could be dug into a little bit more. Like I said, the aircraft's uh, original design goes way, way back to the 1960s, um, but with political delays and other impediments, it wasn't seen in active service until much later uh, and obviously underwent several modifications and changes during the course of its life, including this PP variant, which is a much more modern one. So again, an interesting introduction to the game and an aircraft that is much needed in the Red 4 stable, if you like. And we'll see how its progress develops during the course of the next wee while. Uh, they've been working on it for a spell, so we'll see hopefully some more shots of the interior, exterior, etc., etc., that have been uh, rendered properly, textured, and so on and so forth. And then hopefully uh, we'll also see in, at a later stage the aircraft in flight and in game so stay tuned when more information comes to hand now speaking of renderings the pilot model for the f-18c hornet is a work in progress right now and the ed team tell us that the texturing of all the components has been completed and now it is being animated. That's right, you heard animated there correctly. And this is going to be an authentic recreation of a mid-2000s US Navy Hornet pilot with all of the associated gear and much more lifelike uh, animations to boot. I personally don't uh, use the pilot body in the game. I find it gets in the way of the various switches and controls that I sometimes need to see. Now, this is a personal preference, of course, but I'm interested to see if the new pilot body provides um, less of an impediment to that. Again, it could come down to a preference thing. Uh, regardless, it's still a cool immersion aspect, and I'm always intrigued to see what the artists and renderers can do with the software as it currently stands. Uh, certainly, that is a point of discussion for the maps and the models and things that are coming in the game, particularly with the video, hopefully, that you saw earlier today that I produced on the Normandy 2 map, which has, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of, uh, you know, unique objects. So again, an interesting swing at immersion here from ED, and all of these animations are particularly exciting, what we saw with the supercarrier. So an extension of these uh, human bodies and things in the game and the clothing, etc., is really, really cool. And they tell us here, just to wrap this up, that they are also adding cockpit view uh, for F-16 and A-10C2 pilots, as well as improvements to the MI-24P and the AH-64D crew animations as well. So that's exciting stuff. There's quite a lot of work going on there across the board. So stay tuned for more. And I did see too an F-15 E clip of the hand animations for that particular aircraft being done by Razbam, as well as a new visor system for the Mirage 2000C, wherein you can now uh, pull down the sun visor on the helmet which will give you a different view. And of course, you can see it in the mirrors as well. So that was a nice little touch. These small, again, things that make the game so much more immersive. And it's fun to see these little developments uh, come to the game. And the last thing ED promoted here was a real simulator update for a new force sensing flight control system from this particular hardware manufacturer for peripherals. This system will allow you to connect any of the real simulator or Thrustmaster grips to it and it represents the same displacement and feeling of a real F-16 flight stick. It delivers the same amazing precision and smoothness found in a real Viper. Now it's based on professional force sensing technology. It is in use with the prestigious um, organi organizations such as the US Navy Test Pilot School, the Australian Royal Air Force Test Pilot School, and the French Test Pilot School, among others. These particular devices were the first force sensor bases available for the simulation home market and the development and manufacturing of these high-grade force flight controllers has evolved over the past 16 years according to the blurb here so this new real simulator device has been tested by a group of real test pilots and simulation enthusiasts to tune the feel of the new FSSB R3 Mark II Ultra, as it's termed here, and it is smoother and more precise according to that feedback. Now, this base is not cheap. It will run you around about 490, I think it is, euro, 
Uh, I don't believe that includes the shipping there as well. So that's a separate fee. Uh, so not a cheap device. Now there are some pros and cons with this. Obviously the steep upfront price can be very off-putting for a lot of people. Uh, and if you don't have good hardware in your computer, you probably should be spending your money there. So it starts to get expensive. The one benefit though is once you have a device like this, you you just won't look back. I don't own one myself, but I try to buy high-end equipment, Verpool, Thrustmaster, uh, Winwing, those kinds of uh, groups, uh, because they do produce high-quality equipment. It does work better in game. It tends to hold its calibration, which is really important. I have seen or have used other products where the calibration goes haywire and you're constantly having to adjust it and then it goes out of whack during the game and it's just immensely frustrating. Those cheap products, uh, they just don't last and every everyone's different. It depends on how you use it, obviously, and how it's treated and things like that. But for the most part, when you do buy a quality piece of equipment, you just noticed immediately in game just how much more precise it feels, how much more realistic it is, uh, often easier to use in game in general. And it does give you that longevity. They just don't break down as, as easily. Um, having said that, you know, uh, everyone's different and some user experiences um, are also going to differ. But uh, that's the general theme and that's generally been my impression with um, higher end equipment. So... Uh, again, how you spend your money is your choice, but uh, take a look at the website if you're interested. It's pretty interesting stuff, and I'm always fascinated to see just how much peripheral equipment there is right now uh, from a wide variety of manufacturers, not only for DCS, but also for other flight sims as well. And I think the growth in flight simulators really does uh, indicate we're in this golden era right now, which comes up uh, quite a lot as a topic of discussion because there is so much choice out there and um, there's enough choice too, I think, to give just about every budget a fair shake of the stick, as we used to say back home, and get you into enjoying DCS and other flight simulated related games, which is cool. Now, a, another topic that I get asked about and that is helicopter um third parties nothing unfortunately right now from polychop they have been working i understand on the kiowa um, they are pretty quiet um, they are on catch-up mode because of uh, personal um, impediments to producing uh, the aircraft or at least slowing down their time frames uh, but we haven't really seen anything new as far as i'm aware for for some time uh, specifically related to how things are going in DCS. Uh, another helicopter that people have been asking about was Miltech 5's B0105, which uh, there was some speculation was um, had been shit canned, uh, which according to at least January 27th, that does not seem to be accurate. And Miltech 5 has posted other pictures since then, uh, up until quite recently to just a couple of days ago. So the issue for the team is they're still working. He's still working with Rasbam. Um, he's still producing and rendering uh, interesting shots. And the work is ongoing on the helicopter. But the challenge has been that they uh, do not have a dedicated coder right now. And the coder that they were using has another um, real job, if you like. And so that it has diminished the ability to work, if you like, on the project with um, um, the full attention, essentially. It's not it's not the coder's full-time job. So that's probably going to slow things down a little bit. What I can see from the screenshots, though, look pretty good. The renderings look really awesome. So visually, at least, the helicopter looks good. So the next step really is uh, working on the flight model and um, making sure the systems within the aircraft are all you know, matching up to the expectations expected flight parameters and flight model which is sophisticated stuff with helicopters as we have brought up on this channel previously so none of these projects are you know simple <laughs> and uh, sometimes i think people are a little harsh on some of the developers and uh, miltech 5 actually said that there was some apparently negative uh, comments about the pictures that he was producing and i know rasbam gets shot at um, from time to time and it's a catch-22 do you 
produce a lot of pictures and then not have a working model and then you get shot down for not producing anything after years and years? Or do you say nothing at all and keep it under wraps for years and years and then people think that the project is dead and you become irrelevant compared to other things going on in the business? So you're, you're, I guess you're writing a fine line there, uh, which you can't really win. You know, if you're in the business of marketing your company, I would think you'd want to stay relevant and producing material at least shows something's happening and how much transparency and how much you can reveal obviously is dictated by whatever non-disclosure agreements that you have or other working contracts, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not as simple as just, um, you know, being uh, wearing your heart on your sleeve all the time with regards to the projects that uh, are being worked on. Uh, remember that this aircraft too is um, um, being done by permission with Airbus as well. So um, hopefully, you know, we can see this aircraft in game. It looks really cool. Uh, it's a sophisticated, fairly modern helicopter as well, which I think is neat. And so I'm really enjoying what ED is doing with the helicopter business and these third party companies that have gotten on board to produce some really interesting aircraft for us to fly the different flight characteristics, you know, ranging from the Huey to the Mi-8 to the uh, Black Shark 3 to the Mi-24 to the Apache, um, you know, the Gazelle. Some people have been a little bit critical of that, and I, I haven't had much time in the Gazelle. Uh, I jumped back in the Mi-24 last night for kicks uh, and really enjoyed the flight model again. It just uh, I was really satisfied flying it, and I really do enjoy flying helicopters as much sometimes as I enjoy flying the fixed wing aircraft, uh, sometimes more. And I think with maps that we have coming out, like the Sinai, uh, certainly the uh, Normandy 2 map, which I mentioned earlier, uh, there's a lot to explore. Uh, we're going to have the Kola Peninsula coming up here. Uh, we've got the Northern Territories for Australia. We really do have a wide variety of environments for us to enjoy helicopter flight. And of course, fixed wing as well. And uh, Juice and I, you probably saw from the Air Warfare Group, um, him posting, if you follow both channels, you may be aware of this, that uh, we had some discussion with the developers of uh, RASBAM South Atlantic map. That map is still a work in progress. It is still being developed. And we were um, doing a little bit of live uh, assistance there. Uh, Juice was flying the map and we were looking at a couple of different places. We were talking about some of the airports there. And the team advised us that they are still working on some really cool stuff coming up in the next update. Uh, it looks like we're going to get some more airfields to fly um, out of on the northern portion of the map. And one of the aircraft, uh, or one of the, excuse me, one of the airports that we were looking um, at to fly aircraft out of was uh, one of the developers' uh, favorite places to fly out of. There's some really cool fjords up there, really cool geography. And so I'm super, super excited about that kind of development, what it means for the game, and the enjoyment I get from just exploring maps sometimes without necessarily uh, taking on board uh, complex missions or combat missions. Having said that, one of the things that the RASMAM team for the South Atlantic map are looking for is, you know, professional missions that can that can accompany that particular uh, map, including instant action um, or whatever else you want to do. So if you're interested in that or if you have some skill in that area and you can produce decent uh, and polished missions, uh, maybe reach out to RASBAM and see if that's something that uh, can uh, accompany this particular map as it continues to evolve. Um, obviously, there's a lot of interest in using South Atlantic um, assets from the Falklands era, but it could be any number of different scenarios and uh, enjoying, like I said, the, the map in general. And the more the map evolves in terms of where we can fly and what we can do, and we're talking here grass fields as well now. So... Yeah, uh, maybe reach out because I see so much potential with the maps that uh, we have coming, the maps that we have, and it bodes very well when we see all of these new maps, um, uh, as I mentioned, with, with the South Atlantic, which was uh, full of brand new objects that had to be hand-built. We've seen it now with some of the snippets from the Normandy 2 map. Somebody has to sit down and create those assets. And what it shows me is the potency of uh, potential 
with map design, map development, and the software that ED has. And remember, too, a really good point that somebody else brought up in the discussion that we were having the other day, that these maps are interactive. And there are maps out there and other simulators that are not interactive at all. Uh, they use photogrammetry, and you can't really interact with the environment. Whereas with um, DCS World, barring some you know quirks here and there, you can land on a lot of stuff. You can land on um, objects and, and the ground and actually interact with the map. And this is what's really cool about DCS World and why I'm a fan of the product and why I enjoy seeing new companies take on more maps, notwithstanding the global intention of ED to produce a global map. But these theaters that we're seeing and the updates that we're, we're getting with them bode really well for interactive activity and just the joy of flying and when you have a really cool environment like that it just makes the mission sets and the combat theater so much more vivid so much more exciting and so much more worth playing than just about any other sim out there so let me know what you think about those topics and uh, we'll wrap this up if you enjoyed today's video, don't forget to like and subscribe. Comment in the comment section below about any of the topics that we've discussed or whatever else you want to bring up. Um, if you want to support the channel a little bit more, consider the super thanks button. Uh, keeps the channel chugging along and I really appreciate all the support. I love reading the comments. I love interacting. Even if we don't agree on everything, that's cool. Uh, that's uh, part of the business. And uh, if you have constructive criticism to bring back please do in terms of you know helping us improve this this sim um there's a lot of people doing a lot of work behind the scenes for not a heck of a lot of money uh just because of the love of uh flight simulation so that we can enjoy it as well and uh, there's a lot of cool stuff going on out there in this uh, environment right now in this uh, great great sim so all right that'll do prickly hedgehog out we'll see you next time cheers <laughs>